They may look magnificent just the way they are. Beautiful monuments of gray stone, the color that we're used to seeing, but the stone pyramids in Mesoamerica were originally covered in plaster and then painted mostly red. There were other bright colors as well, but red apparently had a special cultural or religious significance and seemed to be highly symbolic, used in similar ways by numerous cultures of the Americas, such as the Maya. Palenque is an ancient Mayan city located about 500 miles southeast of Mexico City and archaeological finds indicate that the city was occupied at least 500 BC but reached its peak in the 7th century AD under the rule of Pakal also known as Pakal the Great who came to the throne around 615 AD at the age of 12. Now when Pakal died about age 80, he was buried along with five or six human sacrifices in a jade filled tomb and this was deep inside his pyramid which included a jade funerary mask that he wore. The tomb was rediscovered in 1952, but it was in 1994 when they discovered what is now known as the Tomb of the Red Queen, an unknown noblewoman, possibly the wife of Pakal, and the name comes from the red remains in the sarcophagus that were completely covered with a bright red powder made of cinnabar. And the walls of the tomb, in fact the majority of the chamber itself was, was red, clearly symbolic. A symbol can be defined as something that represents a concept, idea, or belief. It can be an object that stands for another meaning, it could be an animal, that represents or implies a certain significance, even a color can be symbolic. For example, the color purple has historically been favored by kings and royalty, often used to signify the head of a nation or the crown chakra. Another color that has been used symbolically since prehistory is red. Probably the earliest example of the use of red ochre on burial sites can be traced back to the Pleistocene where Neanderthal would cover their grave sites with iron oxide or red ochre and many anthropologists believe that this practice was symbolic of a womb and likely involved a ritual because the bodies are always placed in what some call a sleeping position but which might also be called a fetal position, like a baby, with the head facing west, awaiting a new birth, a new dawn. Unfortunately, Neanderthals were not credited with deliberate, meaningful burial of their dead until more than a half century after their discovery. According to pollen samples taken at the Shanidar cave site, this Neanderthal was laid to rest with several different species of flowers, some with medicinal properties, and very obviously arranged deliberately. Red ochre was also used on Cro-Magnon type burials. This ancient grave in Russia dates to around 30,000 years ago. The red ochre pigment sprinkled on the body itself may also have been combined with something like animal fat and applied as a sort of red paint. It's found on artifacts as well and under and around the grave 
and could very well at least partially be symbolic of blood. And if it was ritualistic, may even be considered a magical rite of sorts in the shamanistic tradition. A series of archaeological discoveries in the United States and Canada has uncovered startling new evidence that a previously unknown culture, more advanced than anyone had believed possible, flourished here near the edge of the Arctic Circle many thousands of years ago. In 1882, Augustus Hamlin, the mayor of Bangor, Maine, was guided to a region near the mouth of the Penobscot River by Foster Soper, a local farmer. Soper had told the mayor about a place where blood-colored pools were rising out of the earth. Hamlin was a doctor and a geologist, but he was also an amateur anthropologist, a so-called antiquarian, who believed in theories about the past that scientists would later consider implausible. This part of the main coast had generated legends for hundreds of years, as far back as the 16th century, European explorers had recorded an Indian myth about a fabled place called Norumbega, which they interpreted to be a city overflowing with riches. This map of 1569 placed Norumbega near the mouth of the Penobscot River. Hamlin had searched, but he never found a trace of a lost city. He did find accounts of unexplained stone ruins discovered by the settlers who first cleared the dense forest along the Penobscot River. Like other antiquarians of his time, Hamlin believed that these were the ruins of structures built by Europeans who arrived in the New World before Columbus. The stone ruins of the Northeast were not the only archaeological mysteries which interested the antiquarians. There were also hundreds of prehistoric mounds and earthworks, like these located in the Ohio Valley. As early as the 1700s, amateur scientists had been digging up these mysterious man-made hills and discovering the spectacular remains of an ancient culture. These elaborate burials and artifacts indicated that the mound builders were more advanced than the known Indian tribes of the region. 19th century antiquarians explained this by developing the theory of a lost civilization which existed in America before the Indian and then mysteriously vanished. The earliest mounds were simple circular forms, but later examples evolved into precise geometric designs built on a vast scale. The geometry and surveying skills needed to construct these ritual landscapes seemed to be unknown among the Native Americans. Because there were ancient mounds throughout Europe, other scholars who did not believe in the theory of lost races suggested that the American mounds were built by colonists from the more highly developed cultures of the Old World. They believed in the theory of diffusion that early voyagers brought the mound-building tradition across the Atlantic. Eventually, both of these antiquarian theories would be abandoned as the new discipline of scientific archaeology developed. By the mid-20th century, professional anthropologists would firmly deny that ancient people navigated across the ocean, and they would dismiss as well the idea of lost races. But here, in the landscape forming the heart of the old Norumbega myth, Hamlin, the antiquarian, was about to make a discovery which would eventually change scientific beliefs. Though its real significance was not understood for a hundred years, what he found here was the first evidence of a completely unknown, ancient race of skilled seafaring people who once lived along the Atlantic coast. As a geologist, Hamlin realized he was looking at a high grade of red ochre, iron oxide. The ochre had been turned up by the plow, and the red pools were formed when it mixed with the night rain. Buried in the ochre, Hamlin found artifacts made of polished stone. He knew that Native American peoples used red ochre for war paint and for their rituals. 
But what surprised him was the quality and the perfection of the polished artifacts. The stone woodworking tools were honed to a sharpness rivaling a metal blade, and they were far superior to the artifacts found at Indian sites in Maine. Hamlin brought the tools to the Peabody Museum at Harvard, and the search for the mysterious red paint people was taken up by professional archaeologist Charles C. Willoughby. When Willoughby investigated Hamlin's site, he discovered a mound at the water's edge and began a dig that has been called the first scientific excavation in America. Willoughby's careful measurements and drawings revealed that the artifacts had been buried in ritual patterns. He suspected that they were the remains of ancient graves, but he found no skeletons to confirm his theory. He suggested that the graves were so old that the bones had long ago disintegrated in the acidic New England soil. He built this scale model to be displayed at the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. Along with Willoughby, another archaeologist was presenting his work in the Hall of Anthropology. Warren K. Moorhead became famous when he displayed his discoveries of the Ohio Mound Builder treasure at the exhibition. He was a self-taught archaeologist whose less than careful excavation methods made him a maverick in the profession's eye. But his uncanny nose for spectacular discoveries made his name a household word. Moorhead was searching for the origins of the mound builders, and he soon became interested in Willoughby's site in Maine. Like Hamlin, Moorhead was impressed by the quality of the tools. The workmanship of the polished stone led him to believe that the red paint people had a highly evolved culture. He sent examples back to museums in the Midwest to be shown alongside the artifacts of the mound builders. By the turn of the century, he had excavated several mounds and ritual sites, both in the hills and along the coast of Maine. Moorhead wrote that in all his explorations, he had never examined sites appearing so old. Some of the tools were made from a type of stone not found anywhere in Maine or New England. Moorhead daringly suggested that its source would someday be located in the far north, and he claimed this was evidence of long-distance trade. His prediction was borne out 80 years later, when archaeologists discovered the source of this unusual stone in Rama Bay, northern Labrador, 1,500 nautical miles from the coast of Maine. The stone is now called Rama Chert. Its beautiful translucence and sugary texture make it highly distinctive. The chert has been found in artifact collections as far south as New Jersey and west along the St. Lawrence River into Vermont. The Rama Bay Quarry was the only place in the world where this type of chert could be found, confirming Moorhead's idea of a link between the red paints and the far north. At the time, Moorhead's academic colleagues considered his claims to be too sensational. Some simply dismissed the idea of an advanced prehistoric culture, and others thought that the red paints actually might have been a group of marauding Eskimo from the north. Eventually, Moorhead's career was destroyed. Not surprisingly, the next generation of professional anthropologists avoided the question and the mystery of the red paint culture was temporarily forgotten. It was not until the 1930s that another major discovery occurred in Maine. This one was found by chance under an Indian shell heap on the edge of Blue Hill Bay. These heaps are the discarded remains of shellfish built up by generations of tribes who returned year after year to harvest the ocean creatures. They have been found in many places along the Atlantic coast. On Blue Hill Bay, red ochre began eroding from the bottom of a heap known as the Nevin site. It was brought to the attention of archaeologist Douglas Byers. The layers of crushed shell formed a calcium-rich mixture that neutralized the acidic soil. At the bottom, Byers found the badly disintegrated remains of full skeletons covered in red ochre, just as Moorhead and Willoughby had predicted. Byers also found bone artifacts with surprisingly beautiful decorations engraved into the surface. 
No one had expected to find such precise geometric designs among the red paints. But the most surprising discoveries at the Nevin site were toggling harpoons and the remains of swordfish, a deep water ocean species. These artifacts were the first clue that the red paint people might be a seafaring race. At the time, most of American anthropology resisted this idea. There seemed to be no historical evidence for ocean navigation among the Indians. But then, the next major red paint discovery in Maine occurred on a remote island in Penobscot Bay. In the late 1960s, Dr. Bruce Bork of the Maine State Museum investigated a shell heap on North Haven Island. Near the bottom, he found the remains of a red paint fishing station. The red paint culture predated the mound builder civilizations of the Midwest by more than 2,000 years. And we were surprised to find that most of the bone, or a great deal of the bone, related to maritime activity. Specifically, uh, codfish was very abundant, and, and very surprisingly, swordfish was tremendously abundant. Now, both these animals, swordfish and codfish, are deep water animals. The people of the Moorhead phase were very skilled at going out and traveling the several miles necessary to get to the ideal hunting and fishing places for these two species. The gouges, which are so prominent in the red paint graves, suggest to us a uh, great skill at working wood. And when you combine the evidence we have here for dependence on deep water marine species with the apparent importance or skill in woodworking, the sense then is that these people were maritime hunters who made uh, very competent sea craft. At the same time as Dr. Bork's work in Maine, there was an accidental discovery at the edge of an island in the Canadian Maritimes. Portachua is a fishing community in northwestern Newfoundland. In 1968, construction began for a new movie theater on the outskirts of town. A bulldozer cut through a patch of red ochre, and the work was stopped as Dr. James Tuck from Memorial University in St. John's was called in. I came up to see the, what had been found. It was something that we'd been looking for for a long time because it's apparently the remains of a burial cult that we're interested in. Finally, archaeologists had found skeletons which were preserved well enough to identify, enabling Dr. Tuck to give the red paint people a new scientific name, the Maritime Archaic. Eventually, it turned out to be a site that I guess people had look, been looking for for a hundred years. Uh, there were red paint cemeteries in Maine, but almost never had there been any bone preserved. The site proved to be over 4,000 years old, about the same age as the sites in Maine. When I first saw them, I couldn't believe they were as old as they were. The preservation was uh, almost beyond belief. They looked fresh and new and covered with red ochre. When we completed our analysis of the port -Soir material, we had for the first time a real good look at the sophisticated sea mammal hunting technology or sea hunting technology that these people had. Their weapons included uh, toggling harpoons and barbed harpoons. Uh, these were used to harpoon sea mammals. The polished slate and bone lance points were probably used to dispatch sea mammals, seals and walrus and so forth. Uh, there were specialized fish spears, things called leisters, and a, a very sophisticated and well-developed technology for exploiting the resources of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The spiritual beliefs of the maritime archaic were shaped by powerful forces in the natural environment. Anthropologists use the term shamanism to describe the religion of hunting cultures around the northern globe. Shamanism is not so much a formalized religion, but a way of relating to the spirits of nature. To the shaman, each particular object, animal, and place has a spiritual identity, and the shaman communicates with these forces through a state of trance often experienced alone in the wilderness. This altered state of consciousness is brought on by starvation, physical exertion, or psychoactive substances. The ritual is often accompanied by drumming, chanting, and dancing. The shaman gains intuition and uses it to guide the community. 
curing illness, and ensuring success in hunting and war. These spiritual techniques have existed for thousands of years and have been documented into modern times. This 16th century European print of a sorcerer in a trance was one of the first visual records of native life on the Atlantic coast. 400 years later, anthropologist Franz Boas documented a similar event when he filmed this northwest coast shaman for his study of ritual gestures. Dr. William Fitzhugh of the Smithsonian Institution has himself been exploring the coast of Labrador, searching for the northern limits of the Maritime Archaic. If remains of the red paint people could be found here, it would confirm that the Maritime Archaic were skilled, long-distance navigators. In 1980, on the desolate beaches of Nuviak Cove, Dr. Fitzhugh found what had eluded every other researcher for a hundred years, the remains of red paint house foundations. Nuliak is the largest settlement location that we have found, and I expect uh, it's very near the northern limit of this culture. The reason that they were able to live so far north in an area that's pretty harsh with very rigorous winters and ice cover on the sea for eight months of the year at least is because of a very intensive maritime adaptation. It's a, a type of adaptation which probably extended with variations into New England, but yet there was a homogeneity to the style of life, a kind of a, a similarity, certainly in the ceremonial cultures, to some extent in artifact forms, which bound this entire area of the Northeast, all the way from north of the forest fringe down into the temperate zones. And it's uh, been a puzzle for archaeologists because they could not understand the uh, complexity, the burial ceremonialism, the rather elaborate artifact types in terms of a, a northern, typical northern Indian way of life, something characterized by Algonquin culture, by Montagne, Nascapi Indians, and the Indians we know ethnographically from this area, uh, who traveled in small bands, who hunted uh, uh, caribou, but never got into this intense kind of life which we see indicated by the maritime archaic. The Smithsonian crew began by excavating a small stone mound, which was the first clue that the red paint people had occupied the site. The whole floor is just covered in red ochre. Generally, it's found right in the bottom of the deposit, but probably extends up out of the pit over here a ways. Now, the probability is that these raised ridges isolate living areas within this house. We can see as we come down the inside of the structure, ridges here, here, and two more till we get to the, the end. The Smithsonian crew found the remains of 26 multi-roomed structures, some measuring 90 meters in length. The radiocarbon dates indicate that over 4,000 years ago, large groups of people were living in well-organized communities here at the edge of the Arctic. The Smithsonian crew also began to excavate a foundation that was near a mysterious upright stone. This is a typical deposit uh, containing firecracked rock, chips of ramachurt, fragments of uh, tool making activity, pieces of broken tools that have been burned uh, in the fire, charcoal flecks, red ochre, this whole arrangement of artifacts is a little interesting because of this big stone here, which uh, uh, may have been a structural feature of the house or a seat or uh, have served some other purpose. But it is interesting that the material is, is distributed uh, in a cluster around this, this uh, large uh, rock. Like the small standing stone Dr. Fitzhugh found on the beach at Nuliak, there are other stone monuments in Labrador that also remain an archaeological mystery. Found primarily along the coast, these stone pinnacles may have had both a spiritual and a practical purpose. Some are single slabs propped into vertical position, and others are cairns built up with smaller boulders. The Eskimo refer to these monuments as Anukshuks. Their traditions say that the stone markers point the way to settlements. 
Boat pilots can navigate along the coast by using a simple technique of alignments and angles to identify their positions offshore. These basic principles of geometry may have been developed thousands of years ago by the first cultures adapting to the sea. The technique is still useful today, especially in the far north where modern navigational instruments are not always trustworthy. Here we have a grinding slab of some sort, probably for polishing uh, ground slate axes and gouges. Implements such as stemmed projectile points and knives. They had a whole variety of stem points from large to small, perhaps some for hunting birds, others for sea mammals. And in addition, a very di distinctive artifact, uh, soapstone plummets, which are found in large numbers in uh, southern Labrador maritime archaic sites and seem to be restricted to the 4,000 year old time period. Plummets have often been found in red paint burials, and they were probably used as fishing weights. But the smallest examples are often beautifully crafted, sometimes decorated, and may have been used for other purposes. This engraved pendant from Nuliak is a rare discovery. A complex geometric design, along with other markings, indicate a high level of intellectual development among the maritime archaic over 4,000 years ago. The surprising discovery of this advanced sea culture living in North America has encouraged fresh comparisons with the ancient sea peoples of Northern Europe. The shores of Scandinavia have supported maritime cultures for thousands of years. This fact has been recognized by European archaeologists for decades. In Norway, Professor Paul Siemensen of the Tromsø Museum has studied the remains of cultures that once lived above the Arctic Circle. At the very beginning of, of human habitation after the Ice Age up here, people came along the coast simply because the whole of the inland still were covered by the ice sheets. It's impossible to imagine people walking up along the Norwegian coasts because of the fjords and because of the ice. So it's absolutely necessary that they had a boat and were in some way adapted to the sea. Like the house foundations at Nuliak, the remains of these Stone Age dwellings at Varanger Fjord were also raised above the present shoreline by geological forces. The site was discovered in the 1930s and Professor Siemensen began his excavation of the structures in the early 1950s. On some dwelling places you have fish bones of deep sea fishes and on the same places you have very large and heavy uh, sinking stones meaning that they could fish up to perhaps 100, 120 meters deep. In North America, use of the plummet vanished with the mound builders but in Europe, it evolved as a mariner's tool. This 16th century print shows how the weight attached to a line was used to determine the water's depth. Eventually, the plummet became a basic element of navigational and astronomical instruments. Along with the sea hunting equipment, Professor Siemensen's crew also recovered beautiful tools made out of polished slate. During the excavations of the 30s, Norwegian anthropologist Guttorm Jessing was the first to recognize that the tools were very similar to examples from North America. He wrote, Nowhere on the globe are there to be found remains as closely related as those of Norway and the coast of Maine. During World War II, Jessing retreated to his office to work on a theory suggesting that these cultural developments spread in the far north by diffusion. More important than tools, Yessing identified what he believed to be deeper connections between the spiritual beliefs in both hemispheres. For example, this engraved bone from Norway has a geometric design created by mapping out an alignment of dots and then connecting them to form a straight line. This same technique of aligned dots was also used to engrave the decorations on the bone daggers found at the Nevin site on the coast of Maine. These traits, which are very, very alike, are not only 
traits for practical purpose. They are ornamentation, they are patterns, they are spiritual things. Along with the artwork, Yesing carefully studied the spiritual traditions of northern cultures. This archival footage of a Lapish shaman was filmed in the Norwegian Arctic. It shows a ritual involving a standing stone which may be thousands of years old. Yesing understood that similar tool shapes might be coincidence, but he believed the deep-rooted shamanistic traditions so similar around the globe could only have been the result of diffusion. At first, Yesing's theory of land diffusion was widely hailed by his colleagues. It seemed to finally explain the extraordinary similarities which existed among the circumpolar cultures. Thousands of years ago, there was a channel where these yellow flowers now bloom. On the hills that surrounded the water, they discovered 19 burials. Radiocarbon dates indicated that the graves were over 7,000 years old, 3,000 years older than the maritime archaic sites found in North America. Some of the burials may have been ritual sacrifices this woman wore a large necklace of teeth to her grave. A small child, perhaps her own, was placed at her side. When the woman and child were first discovered, they were covered with red ochre. A round, polished stone lay near the woman's fractured skull, and a knife blade rested at the midsection of the infant. In all these burials, we find the red ochre. That, of course, has been uh, open to a lot of speculation what, what the meaning of the red ochre, how that should be understood. The use of red ochre goes back at least 75,000 years into early Neanderthal times, but the existence of red ochre cemeteries is especially prominent among seagoing peoples. Like the maritime archaic burials in North America, the red ochre cemeteries of Europe are found along the shore. In 1927, here on the island of Teviac, just off the coast of Brittany, French archaeologists Marta and Saint-Just Pequart discovered red paint burials near the bottom of a shell heap. Like Vedbake, the Teviac cemetery proved to be over 7,000 years old, and the burial rituals were similar. But what was unusual about Teviac was that several of the burials had been placed in small stone structures beneath the shell mounds. The Pequarts believed that these might have been early examples of the mysterious stone megaliths left throughout northern Europe and the British Isles by an unknown ancient people. The megalith builders of Europe, like the mound builders of America, were often considered a lost race by 19th century antiquarians. The Pequarts suggested that the red paint people of Teviac were the ancestors of the megalith builders. At the time, their idea was considered too radical. Most anthropologists believe that the chambered mounds and alignments of standing stones had been built by Neolithic farming peoples of a much more recent time period. But further north, along the rocky coasts of western Sweden, conditions made it necessary for the ancient inhabitants to live primarily by fishing, not farming. Cambridge University archaeologist Graham Clark has studied these ancient maritime peoples. His research also suggests that the early megalith builders were a seagoing culture. And it's interesting that among quite a number of maritime sedentary dwellers, we find the appearance of quite elaborate tombs, something which, until recently, we'd always thought of as being a special feature of Neolithic man, Neolithic and later societies. For example, we have uh, stone cairns in the maritime archaic context of Labrador dating from several thousand years before Christ. One of the first things that uh, attracted me to the site was the boulder constructions in a roughly circular arrangement. This uh, was suspected as a burial 
and we've now opened up the center of the burial feature, uh, revealing a pit about two meters in diameter, filled with dark humus stained earth, flakes of ramachurt, bits of mica, and other signs of cultural activity. And this ochre stain, a little bit of ochre stain down here, you can be beginning to get down onto the, at the bottom. So I suspect maybe when we get down below this layer of slabs, we might, we might come down on top of the, the, the feature. Have there been any uh, flakes or charcoals, uh, flakes or anything like that? There's flakes mixed in the burial fill, but no charcoal yet. So, so how much deeper? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, boy. I don't know. And over here, on the east side of the mound, there is a crypt of some sort, a uh, chamber built out of stones in a rather uh, unusual way for well, maritime yeah. archaic culture. We've never seen anything like this before. It is very unusual in this lintel stone on top of these carefully chosen flat rocks. And of course it's um, an interesting fact that if you plot the distribution of megalithic tombs on a map, you will find a large proportion of them on or very close to the coast. This, in the past, was interpreted in terms of diffusion. But it is equally possible that such megalithic structures were built by people whose economy was based fundamentally on fishing, not on farming. The stone ruins along the Atlantic coast have remained a provocative problem in human prehistory. But Professor Clark's work suggests that a new understanding of these early maritime cultures may offer answers in the future. Over 7,000 years ago, these early seagoing people may have been the first highly evolved civilization to inhabit the European coast. Across the Atlantic, where the awareness of an ancient maritime culture along the northeast coast is a brand new idea, the phenomenon of the red paint people may also help to explain the antiquarian mysteries of the New World. As researchers discover more about the maritime archaic, they are beginning to realize that these early sea peoples may have left a legacy with far-ranging effects on the development of Indian cultures in the Northeast. Scientists are unsure of where the maritime archaic tradition began, but the earliest evidence has been found here on the coast of Labrador. When the French fishermen settled here in the 17th century, they named this bay Lance Mort, the Bay of Death. The name gradually changed to Lance Moor, the Bay of Love. Ironically, the primary attraction of Lance Moor today is this burial mound. Excavated by Dr. James Tuck and Professor Robert McGee, the site proved to be one of the most important maritime archaic discoveries in North America. When we first came, we saw only a corner of it that had been exposed by this road construction and subsequent erosion. We excavated the mound in quadrants, and in near the center, there was a rectangular stone cyst made of upright stones. We were a little disappointed because there was no skeleton nor any artifacts in there, uh, a little bit of red ochre. But when we dug below the cyst, just to make sure there was nothing there, we were really surprised to find the skeleton of a child about 12 or 13 years old, buried face down, head to the west. We don't know if it was a male or female because it was too young to be able to tell. It's an unusual burial, uh, especially for so much time and effort and expense to have been lavished on a, a young child. It might be that these are not quite so much, or not entirely for the disposal of the dead, but represent as well uh, renewal rights for the community, holding the <laughs> the uh, community together. A large flat rock lay across the burial and ritual fires had been set due north and south. The charcoal samples were radiocarbon dated to about 7,500 years ago, making this the earliest known maritime archaic burial site in North America. The almost identical dates in both Europe and America were a surprise to scientists. Previous theories about cultural development from the antiquarians to Yessing, were based on the assumption that diffusion had to originate among the more advanced races of Europe. But this new evidence suggests that cultural development may have been parallel on both sides of the Atlantic over 7,000 years ago. 
The evidence also compels diffusionists to ask whether these ancient ceremonial traditions were once carried from North America to the shores of Europe along the prevailing northern route of the Gulf Stream. The Lansa Moor burial is also an important clue to the mystery of the mound builders in North America. It predates the mounds of the Midwest by more than 5,000 years. I suppose you could consider this the start of a mound tradition in the New World. This burial and the ones at Brador and elsewhere are more than 7,000 years old. I think, therefore, that the, they're the oldest burial mounds, certainly in this part of the world, maybe in most of North America. The artifacts themselves included a toggling harpoon of a design we've never seen before or since, and since it's 7,500 years old, it's, if not the oldest, one of the oldest toggling harpoons that's ever been found. Uh, so these guys were pretty sophisticated sea mammal hunters. From the time of Lance Moore, the red paint people flourished for about 4,000 more years. Then, without explanation, the traces of their culture vanish from the archaeological record. The discovery of the maritime archaic represents one of the rare instances when antiquarian mystery and scientific exploration have merged. Together, they have revealed an unknown chapter in the ancient history of North America. Archaeologists have found evidence that disproves the idea that the Clovis people were the first to spread across the Americas via a corridor between the ice sheets of modern Canada. For a better part of the last century, it was taught in all federally funded universities that humans made it from Siberia to Alaska via the Bering Land Bridge before moving down the corridor and populating the rest of North and South America, totally ignoring archaeological evidence in South America, which date back over 30,000 years. So now the obsolete Clovis first theory is finally put to rest. Clovis refers to a type of stone tool technology, a very specific type of bifacial uh, spear tip used for hunting, attributed to a wave of settlers to the New World at the end of the Pleistocene, or Ice Age. In my books, I link up this Clovis spear tool technology to what is called Solutrian technology in Western Europe. This concept is still considered radical in American anthropology and very controversial anywhere where the United Nations has any influence on academia. It implies a Eurocentric perspective on the peopling of the Americas, at least in part. And despite this unpopular concept, a remarkable series of several dozen Solutrian style stone tools dating back between 19,000 and 26,000 years have been discovered at six different locations along the United States East Coast. You can learn more about these finds by following the work of Professor Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institution. Another fascinating Native American artifact that I document is this green slate stone swastika. And if you look closely, you can see that they are snakes or serpents. This symbol was outlawed in 1940 with Native American tribes abandoning it for political reasons. And it seems odd that it is still forbidden 70 years later, especially when it was held in such high esteem by so many Native American tribes. Enough so to not only be posted on Arizona highway signs before World War II, but the swastikas appear on Clovis spear tips if you look close. So what's the danger here? Are we at risk of a Native American uprising and takeover? Or is this ancient peaceful symbol with global distribution since the Ice Age getting a bad rap by the seemingly academically corrupt winners of World War II? And if so, 
what aspect of prehistory are they trying to hide? A mummy three times older than King Tut has been discovered in the Nevada desert. It was found in 1940, about 12 miles east of the town of Fallon. It's a discovery that could possibly unlock some of humankind's early mysteries. But tonight on Special Assignment, Channel 3's Vince Thurla tells us scientists may never get a chance to unlock those mysteries. The excavation with your arms, your shoulders... Outside of Fallon, Nevada, the curious have come to learn more about an ancient society of people who once called this cave home. Not far from this cave, a mummy has been discovered. A mummy that may reveal the secrets of an even older society. One that dates back to the dawn of civilization. This is extremely significant. This is unprecedented. We haven't had a find of this importance in my lifetime. One thing that makes the mummy, known as the spirit cave man, so important are these fine handwoven fabrics discovered at the burial site. These textiles represent a, an extremely sophisticated ability to weave fabric by hand in a time where we didn't realize that people were doing that before. The mummy was discovered tightly bound up in this matting. Out of respect for the dead, this photograph and this drawing are the only two pictures scientists will allow to be publicly displayed. Recent tests reveal that the mummy is 9,000 years old. That's three times older than any other mummy yet discovered in North America. That news has stunned archaeologists. Scientists can get that information by studying the mummy's DNA. That requires cutting a small piece of tissue from the body. And it shouldn't be done. And that, says Paiute Shoshone tribal leader Alvin Moyles, is desecrating the dead. But scientists claim that the mummy is so old that he couldn't possibly be related to the Paiute Shoshones. That the mummy's tribe was here thousands and thousands of years before anybody else. They do not appear similar to any living Native American in North America. They have receding cheekbones, narrow face, long face. Some, some Indians have some of those traits, but as a group, those are Caucasoid traits. The two sides are now caught in a catch-22. One way to prove kinship is through the DNA test. But the tribe doesn't want that because it would require further disturbance of the remains. Whether or not scientists ever get to study the mummy is a matter for the U.S. government's Bureau of Land Management to decide. The DNA evidence would be definitive. Until a decision can be made, the mysterious spirit cave mummy will remain trapped in limbo. Yeah, he's kind of in the legal, spiritual, ethical limbo. In Carson City, Nevada, Vince Sterla, Channel 3 reports. Even mummies can't avoid the law and bureaucracy, it appears. Many archaeologists agree it's entirely possible the mummy is not related to any existing tribe in North America. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the mummy predated most of the Indian tribes from sounds that part of the country. While 1492 is probably most famous as the year given for when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it was also a time of great change in Europe where Jews were facing a choice of mass conversion, expulsion, or worse, a time historically known as the Spanish Inquisition. It seems much of the history we were given about Columbus and the peopling of the Americas is false. Now, talking about Christopher Columbus, a lot of people don't know, but I'm sharing this with you, he was a converso meaning he too was a crypto Jew or a Jew in hiding. It so happens that the majority of the passengers on La Niña, La Pinta, and La Santa Maria, his fleet of ships were of our kind of surname. What kind of surname? Hispanic surnames, Spanish surnames. We are the descendants, many of you are descendants of the secret Jews of Spain. That's the crypto Jews I'm referring to. But what did the elite members of the occult think about this? such as Manly P. Hall, honorary 33rd degree Freemason. Speaking of America, just how did it get that name anyway? Officially, America is named after the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, but this appears doubtful, like so much of American history, which has transformed a one-time pirate of the family name Griego 
into an iconic hero named Christopher Columbus. As for America, according to Manley Hall, America is named after the Plumed Serpent, who is the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and in Peru he was called Amaru. From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an author and anthropologist and would like to invite you to join me in awakening from a long amnesia. Species with amnesia, our forgotten history, gods with amnesia, subterranean worlds of inner earth, the occult secrets of Vril, and 1666, Redemption Through Sin. I would like to thank my subscribers who share my posts as I rely on word of mouth. I appreciate all of the positive feedback, reviews on my books, and I thank you very much for listening.